We had um, we had struggled to get pregnant for several years. I had lost our first baby, um, which, as you know, is just heartrending, devastating. Nothing can possibly prepare you for that. Um, so I was so grateful. I had prayed for so my husband and I had prayed for so many years to get pregnant. So when I when it finally happened with our daughter, I mean, I was overjoyed. I was so grateful, and I understand the blessing of that, but. It also is coupled with the practicality of it was not enjoyable. Hello, Classic Crew, and welcome to today's episode of Let's Be Classic, where I'm interviewing Liz Wheeler. Liz Wheeler is a political commentator, author, and podcast host. You may know her from her time on One America News Network's Tipping Point with Liz Wheeler, and she's also the author of the book Tipping Points, How to Topple the Left's House of Cards. She recently launched her brand new podcast, The Liz Wheeler Show, and it was such fun having her on to interview her. She's such a great guest, and we had such a good time just chatting. She and I are actually friends off the air, so it was nice to talk to her for you you guys with the purpose of introducing her to my audience if you didn't already know her, or if you do know her, now you'll get to know her on an even more personal level. Before we get started, make sure that you're subscribed to my channel and hit that notification bell so that you can always see when I post videos just like this. I'd also love if you would consider subscribing to my Substack newsletter where you'll get access to exclusive content and not available anywhere else. And I just want to quickly mention that my summer jewelry collection is now on sale and the pre-sale actually ends this Friday, June 25th. So if you want to get the awesome sale price on the whole collection, you'll have to get it today or tomorrow or on Friday. So now let's get into it. So thank you so much for coming on my channel today. I'm so excited that you're here. Abby, thanks so much for having me. It's funny, actually, because we have this type of conversation all the time. Personally, it's funny to do it on camera. I know. It <laughs> is really funny. I mean, I just enjoy talking to you, and I've talked to you on a personal level so much that it's really fun to do this in a way where it's like four people for an audience. <laughs> Yeah, both of us actually wearing hair and makeup to have the conversation. <laughs> exactly, and I'm not folding laundry. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to start off by talking about your new podcast, which you just recently launched, The Liz Wheeler Show. Can you tell us about it? And how did you know you wanted to start a podcast? Yeah, definitely. We just completed our fourth week of it. It's hard to believe that we've been doing it for a month already. And it's so much fun. One of, one of the things that drew me to the video podcast format is I wanted a more personal connection with my audience that you you don't get with the formality of cable news, as fun as that venue is too. But I wanted a more personal connection with my audience. And so far, that's that's come to fruition through this podcast so I can keep my trademark um, my trademark research and facts and you know have present in sort of an unapologetic let's go after the radical left way but it's also more of a conversation with people where I can explain my thought process and show the research show how I come to a certain opinion versus just presenting the news while putting a little opinion in there. Uh, here and there. So it's been really fun. It also helps us because it's my show and I can do it my way. It helps us get around, you know, big tech censorship that um, can be a problem. And we are dealing with that, by the way. And it also helps us get around any kind of corporate wokeism, if you will, any kind of uh, control of cable news networks that can sometimes be non-ideal for uh, conservative commentators. So going independent is really, right now, it's the best of all worlds. It's a blast. Yeah, I mean, you know that I love doing it. I love having my YouTube yeah. channel and <laughs> and running my own channel. It makes a huge difference when you get to be in control of your content and you get that really special relationship with your audience. Yeah, definitely. And as we say off the air, neither of us really like having bosses, so... <laughs> <laughs> And I mean, I have been loving your podcast. Everyone needs to go check her out. It's going to be in the description box. So I'll mention that again at the end, but I needed to say it now because I've been loving listening. Um, so I want to talk about you've been in politics a really long time. So can you share how you got started as a commentator? 
Yeah, definitely. And it's it's weird to think that I've been involved in something a long time since I'm only 31. <laughs> yeah. But I got involved in politics in late high school, actually. I was raised in a conservative, Catholic, Christian family. So my parents were open with us about the way that they voted and what their political beliefs were. But it wasn't something that I took part in. We weren't going to rallies or in being involved in any kind of activism as a child. But around, the t- around late high school when um, – it was actually like 2007, I think – when Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton were battling it out for the Democratic primary, I started paying a lot closer of attention. And I realized that I really liked the kind of argumentative politics. Plus, it meant something to me. It meant something to me to see these people arguing about policies that would impact my personal life, right? And so I really got involved in politics. I started watching everything that was going on. I started reading as much as possible. And the reading predated the involvement in politics, but I started reading everything political that I could get my hands on. I joined Twitter at that time. This was when political Twitter was in its infancy, so very, very much different than it is now. But it was a way back then to to get involved with conversation, in conversations with political thought leaders, because it was such a small community at the time that you could you could talk to prominent figures and you know discuss and debate different policy topics, and you could actually be seen and heard um, because it was smaller. It, it's great now, but it was very different back then. So I, I, that's really when I got involved and it just snowballed from there. I loved it. So I kept going. Yeah. I love what you do because you are such a firebrand and you have such strong opinions, but it's really backed up by the research that you do. And that's, I think, a unique quality because you can see many I mean, this is female and male commentators who don't know a lot, but but will necessarily then be very like, this is what I think. And it's nice to, <laughs> to see somebody take these really strong stands and also really know what you're talking about. Well, that's basically, I appreciate that because that's basically the highest compliment that you can pay to me because that's what I try to do. I I try not to be just a propagator of talking points. I try not to say, this is the right side, this is the talking point, and believe it because I say it. I really <laughs> don't want to be that person. I want to say, well, listen, this is the worldview that I, that I see the world from. This is the reason I've taken this principled position, and this is how that principle applies to practical policy. So I try to walk people through why I believe what I I believe. And I and I, I certainly don't form opinions just based on party allegiance. I form opinions or I form party allegiance based on the fact that we agree on policy. So policy and principle come first. Um, political allegiance comes second. And allegiance to politicians just doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a, a good policy on its own. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> um, for my audience, what piece of advice can you offer to them if they want to be more vocal about being conservative? Sure. So the best piece of advice is make sure that you know what you're talking about. Don't just jump in the ring and try to be another loud voice. Try to get retweets or clicks or get in arguments when you really don't know the facts. So before you get to the fun part, I guess, do your research. And I don't just mean read an article and look up a fact. Read as many books as possible. Study political philosophy. Study history. Study, you know, everything that's happened so far in our nation's brief history to see the ramifications and the consequences of the different types of policies that we've already tried. Look around the world and study that same thing thing. I mean, in in the decade, in the past decade and a half, I've read as many books as I can get my hands on. I'm sure there's people out there who've read more than me, but it's it's really been amazing to see how sometimes years down the line, uh, after I've read a particular book or studied a particular era of history, years down the line, I'll be like, oh, that's right. I read about that. We've tried that already in some other country or in some other era and some president had already done it. And this is how it turned out. So why would we repeat that now? So really study what you uh, what you want to talk about before you talk, and then join Twitter. Get involved in the conversation there. Anybody can take part in that. You can start debating with liberals. You can you know put your own opinion out there. Start writing op eds. Submit them to blogs and independent websites, and just get involved. If you want to get involved, just do it. Yeah, I love that. I love the idea that exactly how you live your life. It is most important to know what you're talking about (laughs) before. I think that we often get kind of caught up 
nowadays and the idea of getting involved in the fight and just being involved at all is taking a good stand and that's not correct. I mean, you have to take, you have to know what you're talking about before you take a stand. And then on top of that, it's really good advice to just, you know, get involved, start, because so much of what we are able to uh, do nowadays and get involved with is free. <laughs> It's all on the internet. Yeah. So Twitter is free. YouTube is free. The places that you want to submit your articles to, there's no fee for you to pay if you want to submit an article or start a blog. I mean, all that stuff is free to you. So it's really up to you right. to take that first step. Right. And it also translates um, into activism in your community, too. If you feel called to run for school board or city council or mayor or state representative, if you feel called to uh, join an organization, say a pro-life organization or your local Republican Party and door knock and talk to people, all the experience that you've gotten from reading, learning about what policy topics that you're talking about or practicing these debate things on Twitter, that's going to translate into in-person in-person activism and in-person participation as well. And we always need good, solid, principled conservatives to be involved in the public aspects of life as well, not just punditry. Absolutely. So moving on to motherhood. You're a new mom. How yes. has it been being a new mom to your beautiful daughter? Um, it's been everything that, everything cliche that people say that it is. I love this little girl with my whole heart. It's amazing how obsessed you are from the moment, you know, you get that squirmy little bundle in your arms. It's absolutely incredible. Um, also, the sleep deficit, that stuff is real. <laughs> But it's, it's, it's amazing. I love being her mom. It's my favorite thing. It's, it's changed my outlook on life. Yeah, I can. I, I mean, I've seen your little girl. She's beautiful. Yes. <laughs> She's adorable. And I think you are going to be, I mean, you are the most amazing mom. Just seeing the way that you like, you know, hold her and love her. It's just the best. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you. I hope so. I mean, she's she's going to be five months next week, so she's at a pretty adorable... Yeah, she just learned to roll over. She's developing a little attitude where she tells us when when she wants what she wants. It's, it's, it's a delight to get to know her. That's actually been probably the most fun, is just seeing her little personality develop and see her become a part of our family. It's, it's, it's a gift from God. It truly is. Yeah. And, and what was pregnancy like for you? Oh, I did not enjoy pregnancy one bit from start to finish. <laughs> and let me caveat that by saying we had um, we had struggled to get pregnant for several years. I had lost our first baby, um, which, as you know, is just heart-rending, devastating. Nothing can possibly prepare you for that. Um, so I was so grateful. I had prayed for so—my husband and I had prayed for so many years to get pregnant— so when I when it finally happened with our daughter, I mean, I was overjoyed. I was so grateful. And I understand the blessing of that. But it also is coupled with the practicality of it was not enjoyable. I had hyperemesis gravidarum, which, yes, you're familiar with that. Probably most of our viewers are. But colloquially, it's the barfing disease that Kate Middleton had when she was pregnant, where you, you vomit dozens of times a day. You're sicker than when you have food poisoning and the flu for about the first 25 weeks of pregnancy. So that was pretty rough, um, not yeah. going to lie. And then the second half of pregnancy is just very, very uncomfortable, <laughs> especially for someone I think as small as I am. I My baby was not a small baby. She was eight pounds, four ounces. Wow. Yeah. And I, star I started pregnancy at about 105 pounds. So... Um, <laughs> It, it, it wasn't that enjoyable. It was amazing, though, when she got big enough that I could feel her inside. That I would just sit there. I would just sit there for hours just watching my, watching my stomach shape shift, watch her flip or, or feeling her flip around in there. It was amazing. Yeah, I think that's so cool. And I think that it's really important to talk about that pregnancy isn't the easiest thing because pregnancy doesn't have to be easy for it to be worth it. And I think there's this misconception Absolutely. that, you know, if you are pro-life, then that must mean that you think all pregnancies are just simple and easy and nice, but that's not the case. Like, they're not, there's right. not a, a relation between how comfortable pregnancy is and how worthy a person is of being alive <laughs> and being born. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think a lot of women probably feel guilty saying, well, I didn't really enjoy pregnancy because they think, oh, maybe that's that maybe that would be something personal against the baby. Absolutely not. I mean, it's just in practicality. Some women I know it's very comfortable for. They don't mind it. They enjoy it. 
I don't understand that. <laughs> I wish that were the case, I guess. But I viewed it just as part of the sacrificial love. Like by the time this little girl was born, by the time I gave birth to her, I had already poured so much love into her that we were entirely bonded, not just because she'd been in my body, but because day in and day out, I was sacrificing out of love for her. And so that's how I viewed it. I didn't I didn't feel bad for not enjoying the practicalities of it. I just thought, listen, this is, this is the active part of love, the part where, yeah, you feel it in your heart, but it's also a choice and a behavior that you know that you're faced with every single day and I I mean I would do it all again for her yeah no I I think that's I think that's so important and I I'm glad you talked about it so are there any books on either pregnancy or motherhood that you would recommend for somebody who wants to be pregnant who is pregnant who's a mom (laughs) any of those things well the two books I think that I found the most helpful, and believe it or not, I know I this is a little contradictory because I just said that you should read as much as possible about what you want to know about and know what you're talking about. I personally was so anxious the first trimester of pregnancy because I had lost before. I had a hard time studying and reading anything about it. Um, pretty much the first half of my pregnancy, I will admit. Um, but the two books that I found to be the most practically helpful were Ina Mae Gaskin's Guide to Childbirth. She's probably the most famous midwife in the country. Um, And I wanted to give natural childbirth, which I did. And her book was simply invaluable. It was not only helpful in the philosophical sense, but it was really there were a ton of practical tips in there that a lot of times are left out of hospital births, I think. And I gave birth in a hospital. I just mean medical births. Um, But a lot of a lot of that it's almost like the art of childbirth has been lost. Mothers don't necessarily pass that on to their daughters the same as they used to. And so the practical tips in this book, which my mom ironically recommended to me because she also gave birth naturally, um, was really, really helpful. So Ina Mae Gaskin's Guide to Childbirth. And then the second one that was very helpful was The Womanly Art of Breastfeeding. That's the same thing. It not only Um, It not only encourages women to breastfeed and talks about the importance of it, it gives you practical tips for everything you need to know because it's actually not as easy as just give birth and the baby latches on. It's 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 difficult at first. It can be a struggle and it can be an on it can be an ongoing struggle. But women's bodies were made to do it. As long as you know how to troubleshoot that and have support, your body's got it. Yeah, that's, I mean, I've heard really great things about her work. I also looked her up online because we have talked about this a little bit behind the scenes. (laughs) (laughs) And um, I wanted to kind of hear, read more about her and see what this was about. And it is fascinating. It was actually very funny. I was had a conversation with my mom because my mom had four C-sections. She's a tiny little person. And my dad is six feet tall. So (laughs) she had four about 10 pound babies. Um, Oh my goodness, what a champion. (laughs) (laughs) Just didn't work out. But so I always thought, you know, if I talked to my mom about being interested in natural childbirth, she would be like, oh, you know, I I don't know. I I don't know why you would do that. But I recently had a conversation with her and she said that with the first, my brother, she had actually tried to do it naturally and had not had any like epidural or anything during the whole first, you know, 10 hours of labor. And she said, yeah, it wasn't that painful. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> okay, I guess you're just, oh, I, wow. like, <laughs> I was like, I guess maybe if I'm similar to you and I can actually get a baby out because I'm 5'8 and you're 5'1", like, I'll take that. I'll take that not being that painful. Everything I've heard, that's not the case, but <laughs> did give Here's me- the most helpful thing that I read in Ina Mae Gaskin's book though. Um, because I didn't have an epidural either. I did it I did it without any pain medication, without mitigating the pain um, with anything pharmaceutical. I would say you can't try to avoid the pain. If you try to avoid the pain, then your mindset is going to be contradictory to your experience because it does hurt. It is very difficult. It's very hard. It's very tiring. And sometimes it's very, very painful. But if you accept the pain, If you know that it's going to hurt to a certain extent, you know that it's going to be unpleasant, you know that it's going to be, as the name entails, labor, and you allow yourself to internalize that and kind of just say, okay, wash over my body versus trying to tense up your body and reject it, that made a a huge difference for me in labor. Because if I hadn't read that, I would have had the attitude of, let's try to do everything we can to avoid the pain. How do we mitigate this? How do we get around it? But because I read that in the book, I used that mental technique. I said, okay, allow this contraction to take over your body, allow it to wash through you, and then allow it to wash away from you when it's done. That was actually probably the number one technique that allowed me to 
to tolerate labor. Wow. That's a really, yeah. And I mean, it make, that again reminds me of my mom because she told me that the first hour she was in the hospital, she kept trying to walk it off. <laughs> <laughs> the doctors were like, you can't walk this off. This isn't happening. <laughs> That's so funny. That's very funny. I know. After like the first 40 minutes of contractions, just a joke. Um, I, it was just a joke. I, I lifted up the gown and I was like, is the baby out yet? Because that one hurt pretty bad. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure that's going to be me. She was not. (laughs) I believe it. (laughs) Um, So beauty and fashion, uh, you are gorgeous. Everyone knows it. So what's your, let's talk about your beauty routine. Um, What's your skincare routine? Because I personally struggle with acne, even at 27. I have some issues with that, especially around my hormonal, you know, sections of the month. So what is your skincare routine? Yeah, a lot of people do. That's fortunately not something that I struggle with anymore. And I think I can identify the exact reason why. And it's because of the way that I eat. So again, you and I have talked about this at length (laughs) off the air, but I in high school was diagnosed with a cell disease similar to an autoimmune disease. And the way that I manage that, the way that I keep it at bay is through diet. I'm vegan, not not because of any animal rights reasons, but just because it's a very low inflammation diet. Meat and dairy and all of that stuff feeds into inflammation in your body. So I cut all of that out. Um, and I eat a very clean plant-based diet in order to manage my health problems. And when I did that, all kinds of other, I guess, tangential or peripheral Health, uh, issues in my body also cleared up. So I don't have acne anymore. I don't typically have period cramps or back aches at that time of the month. Um, all, all that, I don't even have moodiness really before my cycle. All kinds of hormonal things were also taken care of when I um, changed my diet. So that's the number one thing that I say for skincare is, you know, don't eat meat, don't eat, don't eat sugar, try to eat as many vegetables as you can, drink as much water as you can flaxseed does amazing. I put flaxseed in my kale shakes every morning. Um, That makes a huge difference in your skin. It makes your skin glow. And then for a cleanser, I use uh, grapeseed oil, just kitchen grade from my kitchen cabinet, from my pantry, grapeseed oil. And I, uh, I do a hot compress on my face to get the makeup off and then press grapeseed oil into my face. It works as a natural antibacterial and an exfoliant. And it just, I mean, it makes your skin glow. That's amazing. I am so impressed by people who live their lives living like with a strict diet that's good for you. (laughs) I wish I had that self-control and it's something that I work on. I need to get better at because, you know, I try to eat vaguely healthy, but I probably could work on it more than I do. And so people who really do, you know, change their diet and see these amazing changes in their body, I'm like, I should just do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's also, it's also, I don't know if I would have the willpower to do it if it weren't that binary option of bad health versus, you know, sacrificing eating junk food so that I can be operable in life. So if you're faced with that, I'm sure you'd be able to do it too. True enough. And, you know, I have my own version of it, but it's not so much of a of a choice, I suppose, which is like living kosher style and then, yeah. you know, eventually being kosher. Uh you know, I grew up with it, so it doesn't feel like a choice, but it's something that I, I choose to do every day, I suppose. So Definitely. I guess I have my mini version of it, <laughs> my yeah, religious that, I mean, version. That's pretty, it's pretty much the same thing. Once you get adapted to it, when I first started, it was very difficult because I didn't know what to cook and uh, what to buy at the grocery store. But once you get adapted to it, it's just normalized. It's just normal to me. Yeah. So what about beauty products? Do you have any favorite beauty products that you like have to use or always use or anything like that? Um, okay, so again, this is kind of funny because I my my entire makeup box is about this big. I have basically one product for each for each part of my face. I'm not actually a beauty guru. I know how to put basically one face of makeup on to go on air. I like to stick to the neutral tones, as you know. Um, my favorite product that I use on my face is either the moisturizer that I put on before um, my makeup, which is M61. Um, yeah, it works really well. I think it's it's not actually supposed to be a primer. It's just a moisturizer, but I think it works amazingly and it doesn't clog the pores. But I really like my Anastasia eyebrow uh, eyebrow pencil because it is it's great. I mean, it's not too dark, it's not too light. It just gives you that that fill in for your eyebrows. And I'm all about I'm all about a nice fierce set of eyebrows. I was gonna say I'm into good eyebrows, so I appreciate your eyebrows. They look great. <laughs> <laughs> 
So as far as style, do you have any style icons that you try to emulate? Um, I wish I could say yes, but I would say my style icon is my youngest sister, my 18-year-old sister, who, who has entire veto power over my closet. Um, and uh, she's been exercising that a lot recently post-baby. So she's, she's, she's uh, refreshed my fashion a little bit um, since my body has changed somewhat since over pregnancy and then obviously birth and breastfeeding. So I, not really in the fashion industry, no real icons, but man, that girl can style. <laughs> Do you have any specific fashion rules that you follow? Like volume, if you're going to wear volume on top, you should wear something fitted on the bottom or stuff like that. Or do you have a specific kind of just look that you prefer, something more tailored versus something more drapey? Yeah, I would say for the bottom half, I try to go more tailored. I'm all about the high-waisted jeans. I am really into the mom jeans right now, not because I'm a mom, but like the stylish ripped mom jeans. Um, but I'm all about the high-waisted shorts, all about the high-waisted pants. I do like tailored clothes because as you know, I'm relatively thin. And if I wear drapey clothes, it can make me look a little bit like a coat hanger, a little bit, uh, a little bit bony. So I do try to, I do try to kind of like this top actually. It's not, it's not form fitting per se, but it's, it's nice and tailored. So it, it shows a little shape and it's just classic. That I think is the theme of my fashion is just a uh, classic with just, just a drop, just a sprinkle of trendiness in there. I don't like to jump too much on the trends because I don't want to look back in 20 or 30 years and, uh, and have my daughter say, what on earth were you thinking? I want it to be at least somewhat timeless. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I tend to agree with that. I think that's very much a descriptor of my style as well, which is classic with a, a hint of trendy. I'm not just... Yeah, you can, you can pull off a trend, though, that I cannot pull off. And this is because you're taller. You can pull off the midi dresses <laughs> that, come, that come a little bit below your knee, just to your calf. I look ridiculous in those dresses because I'm pretty short. Yeah, no, I have... There are certain st styles that are better for certain bodies types for sure like you know I have a bigger bust so if I tried to wear anything that's like super boxy it's just oh she weighs 40 pounds more than she does <laughs> uh, but you know there there are certain clothes that look great on your kind of body type and don't look as good on mine or vice versa so you know it's figuring out how to dress your body and make it look the best that it can definitely definitely that's that's the that's the element of timelessness in fashion I think that I, that I try not to let be overrun just by trends that might not look good on me. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the danger with trends. And it's something I try to steer my, my audience away from is don't just wear a trend because it's trendy, because it may not be flattering for you. And that's yeah. totally fine. I mean, there's a ton of trends that I would never wear, but just Do you want me to tell you about a trend that I want to wear that my youngest sister is not allowing me to wear? Yeah. I'm so into this. I think it's so cute. Hats. <laughs> I really want I really want to wear hats and I'm talking about like sort of the beachy style hat that kind of hat that you'd wear with jean shorts and a crop top in the summer. I think they're so cute the ones that are sort of pinned on the back of your head. Um, I've been told that this is a no go for me. <laughs> Yeah, like I said, everyone, we all have these certain things that just don't work for us. I mean, I'll never be pro a bucket hat personally, but um, oh no, but you know, I I think that we can all figure out what works for us. So yeah, <laughs> as far as dating and relationships, I love talking about dating and relationships with the conservative women I have on my channel because I think we have a different perspective than so much of what you're getting in media. And I want to share that perspective with my subscribers because I think a lot of my subscribers are looking for that. So what advice do you have for young women who are dating? Well, make sure you know what values are important to you in a spouse. Uh, make sure you understand uh, what you would want your future family to look like. Um, and then be discerning when you're picking a dating partner because nothing's worse than falling in love with someone that you have nothing in common with because that happens because there are a lot of great people who don't share your values. You fall in love with their personality. You fall in love with maybe their mind. But if you don't share a vision for what you want your life to look like practically, then you are going to be very challenged, I will say, at the very least, entering into a marriage with that person. And I know that sounds kind of pessimistic or kind of negative, but I, I, I think it's very important. I mean, we all know people who have been in those situations. Um, the other thing, though, and I think that this is, this is something that conservatives tend 
to fall into this trap. And it's it's well intended. It's well intended. But sometimes conservatives start dating someone and immediately start thinking about marriage. And that's that's fine and good in a sense. But there's also a season of life that is that is appropriate just to enjoy dating that other person, enjoy getting to know that person before you're trying to apply them, copy and paste them into this preconceived notion about what you want marriage and a husband and a father of your kids and a life to look like. So don't be in a rush to, when you start dating someone, to immediately take it to the next level, to immediately get engaged, immediately get married as quickly as possible. That works for some people. It does. I mean, I have friends who had that's worked for. You and uh, you and your husband got engaged much quicker than me and my husband did. And different things can work for different people. But the mindset of going into a relationship and skipping almost like the, uh, I don't want to say courtship because that has connotations, I guess evangelical connotations of chaperones and all that kind of stuff that I'm not talking about. But the season of just enjoyment, of dating, of fun adventures, don't be too quick to rush through that because that's a really, that's a really special season of life. I, yeah, I think that's an also an, a new perspective I haven't heard on my channel before, and I think it's very true. Um, to go back to your first point, something I always say is you can't choose who you love, but you can choose who you don't love. And what I mean by that is you can't make yourself love someone who you don't have chemistry with. If you try right. and like, if you're compatible, but you just don't really get along, you can't, it's very difficult to make yourself have a deeper feeling for that person. But if you already have chemistry with someone and no compatibility with them, you can remove yourself from that situation quickly. Yeah. Cause if you don't, then that is the situation that you're describing where you are kind of in too deep with someone who you don't share values with and you don't share compatibility with. And that's really hard to make last. And it's incredibly painful when it ends. It is. And I think that's one of the things I was actually discussing this with um, with a friend recently. I think that's one of the things that our society and maybe this is the more religious aspect of society. So, you know, practicing Jews, practicing Christians, practicing Catholics, maybe this is conservatives in general. I don't know. But our society has moved away from um, friends and family giving their opinion and advice and even a blessing or approval to um, to new budding relationships. And I understand why we moved away from that, because we were too far the other direction where, you know, a father actually had to give permission for a young woman, a grown woman to to get married. And, you know, I don't think any of us want to be told, oh, who we can marry or who we cannot marry. And we just course corrected a little bit too far. Instead of saying, hey, let's respect your independence and, you know, still be an active part maybe in advising on relationships, we've now excluded, whether it's faith leaders, whether it's parents, even sometimes friends and family are hesitant to point out red flags or to say, listen, this is a situation that you know, other people have experienced, and it's a difficult situation. So, you know, maybe take some time and address that before you move forward. We've course corrected a little too far. And I think um, we'd maybe do well to, to be a little more opinionated about other people's relationships, just because sometimes if you're in one of those situations, you don't know what the ramifications are, should you marry that person? Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with you. And I, I like the kind of the description you gave of that. I know that I've been involved with a friend of mine having a breakup where she had a situation where she was dating a guy who was not right for her and her family came on too strong, too hard, and she knew she needed to break up with him, but she couldn't hear it in that way. And having yeah. a friend come and sit with her and say, you know, I understand what you're going through. I totally know why this happened, but I don't think that long term, this is a great choice that should be allowed. And I think very often friendship has been turned away from actually offering advice and into support, 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 you do you. Yeah, and just it's not, validation. Yes, and that's really not what friendship should be. That's not Absolutely. how real people, <laughs> you know, support each other. The best friendships I have are the friends who are willing to, to point out when something isn't the best and how I can improve. I mean, that's why my relationship with my husband is so good, because we can do that for each other. Yeah, definitely. And that's why my best girlfriends I've been friends with um, since I was a child, because that's what we do. It's not just rah, 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 let's be a girl squad and all like have each other's back in the validating sense. We're honest with each other and we're there for each other when times get hard. And those two things are compatible to be honest and to be there 
um, when when things are hard. And I like I said, I think that's been lost a little bit in the way that conservatives conduct relationships. And maybe we do well to, um, I guess, not be not be so sensitive if other people are giving opinions on on your relationship. And I, like I said, I'm not advocating for fathers to go back to giving permission to their daughter or for overbearing family members to constantly be criticizing. No, I'm talking about those you're closest with. And honestly, the people that are in the relationship themselves may be being open to hearing an honest opinion about um, about their relationship. Yeah, I totally agree. Well, actually, going off of what you were just saying, um, I'm curious, do you have any advice for how to find friendships that are long lasting? Because I think that's really hard nowadays to find, maybe within faith circles it's a little bit easier, but it can be difficult to find friendships that actually last because they're not just based on shared interests, they're based on something deeper. So do you have any advice on that? Well, I would just echo exactly what you said, that I think a lot of times people try to find friends based on shared interests. And it is fun to have friends who have shared interests, of course. Um, But my longest lasting, deepest friendships are with women who share my worldview and share my values. And we don't actually share interests all the time. We don't share hobbies. We don't share likes and dislikes. But it doesn't matter. Our friendships have endured. I mean, my best friend, I literally have been friends with her since we were born. Our parents were friends. So we've our, our friendship has spanned not only childhood and adolescence, but now adulthood and motherhood. And we we don't have the same hobbies. We don't have the same interests. We don't have the same personalities. But we always, always share a worldview on the important on the important things, on the spiritual, on the, uh, I don't even want to say political in just the Washington, D.C. politics way, but in the way that we're raising our families and the way that we're conducting our marriages and the way that we relate to people in the world, those things we share. And so our friendship has endured. And that's the same with, like I said, my closest, deepest relationships with my girlfriends. Uh, we share, um, I mean, we share religion and we share, we share values. Yeah, I think that's, I think that the reason that matters is because then you can go to those friends for advice. If you have a friend who you only share interests with, then going to them for advice may not be the safest route because you don't necessarily trust their opinion. But going to a friend who does share your worldview and your perspective means that you can actually expect to hear something that would match with how you view the world. Right. Plus, as we grow and evolve... Um, as individuals and, you know, as wives and as daughters, our interests are going to change. I mean, my interests now at age 31 are not the same as my interests at 16. They're not the same as my interests at 25. And I assume they're not the same as my interests at, you know, 40. Now, some some of my interests might be consistent, sure. But if you're only friends with uh, people who share your interests, then you're going to outgrow those friends when you outgrow those particular hobbies or those particular interests. It's gonna it's going to be hard to create a lifelong friendship with someone like that. Yeah, absolutely. So going back to dating and marriage, what life lessons can you share about marriage now that you've been married for how long? Uh, almost four years. Yeah. So how, 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 what have you learned in that time? Um, well, I feel unqualified here since I am such a newbie in marriage. I still feel like we're newlyweds in a sense, uh, just under four years. I would say my biggest life lesson, um, when our biggest lesson about marriage is that men and women are very, very different, obviously not just physically, but the way that we process things, our expectations are very different. And um, I, I've talked about these books written by Shanti Feldhahn before. These were perhaps the most eye-opening relationship books that I've ever read. And not just romantic relationships, but any kind of relationship that you have with someone from the same gender or a different gender in the workplace, in friendships, in school, of course, in romantic relationships, but for men only and for women only by Shanti Feldhahn. Um, those are the most eye-opening books out there, I think, because they just show how men and women interpret things, interpret the same thing differently, and how, um, from a religious perspective, how men really have built their entire... I don't even know how to phrase this well, actually, how men's entire worldview is about respect while women's entire worldview is about love. Now, this is, of course, generalizing, but because we're looking at life and at relationships at our partner, at our spouse, through these different prisms, we interpret... Um, actions and behaviors differently because we're looking at it through different prisms. And knowing that my husband interprets things through the prism of respect has helped me adapt my behavior so that he 
um, so that he understands how much I respect him, so that he understands how proud I am to be his wife, so that I'm not just speaking in my own love language to him, but I can adequately communicate through words and behavior um, how important he is in our marriage and so that we don't have as many miscommunications based on, you know, speaking our own language. Yeah. I think that, and I think this all gets lost nowadays when we're trying to completely erase the difference between men and women. I think that's really not going to be helpful for women entering marriage when they realize, no, it's oh, not. <laughs> oh no, no, men and women are very different. <laughs> yes, very different. A good example would be my husband loves really intense strategic board games. Loves them. Like, <laughs> biggest hobby ever. I know some women who enjoy this. I personally, and a lot of the people, women I know, do not enjoy this. <laughs> They're less interested in the really intense strategic games and a little bit more interested in the social games. The ones where you're like, you know, charades and monikers and stuff like that. Um, it's a, it's something that we talk about quite frequently because he'll want to play one of these intense strategic games. And I'm like, Monopoly? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, my husband and I, that's how we are with movies. I mean, he likes the, he likes the war movies, the, the epic movies. And, um, I truly couldn't care less about watching those. I, I, that's actually changed too, since being a mother, um, since, since my little girls arrived, I actually have like less tolerance of the violence in movies. And this is, of course, fiction movies, but I have less tolerance of death and gore and destruction in those movies. So we, we do not watch movies that often together because we don't have similar tastes at all in movies. That's really funny. Yeah, a big, uh, one of the ways that my husband and I kind of watch movies together, because again, we, we also have disparate tastes. I enjoy period dramas. <laughs> yeah, same. <laughs> <laughs> he uh, likes a lot of action movies. One of the things that brings us together is watching just terrible bad B movies because they both they make us laugh. So that, that's how we watch that's how we watch movies together. <laughs> oh, that's a good tip. Yeah, we've watched some comedies together, but I I I also appreciate more of the uh uh, a good Jane Austen movie is probably the only one that's gonna gonna satisfy me. I'm actually I'm not that big of a movie watcher anyway because I don't have the attention span for it. It either doesn't hold my interest or I fall asleep. <laughs> Yeah, I, I feel that as well. I feel like once you get married, all of a sudden you start falling asleep at movies. I mean, that may have been the case for you before, but it definitely <laughs> is the case for me now where I <laughs> will watch a movie and all of a sudden I'm like, okay, let's finish tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I just can't keep my eyes open. <laughs> So now that you're a mom and you have started your amazing podcast, how do you balance life and work? Because you know, as women, we're constantly looking for that work-life balance. I think the fact is that it's true for men also. It's a more intense situation for women. But I am curious to know, how do you, how do you make that work? Well, I'm only four and a half months into motherhood, so I may not be the expert on this. What I've done so far is I've tried to um, do more of, of integrated parenting with work, meaning I try to, I'm lucky that I'm able to do uh, a lot of show prep and a lot of my work from home at this time. Um, and so I, I just, I do shifts with each one. I try to try to wear two hats at the same time. You know, I'm breastfeeding my baby, so I'm not away from her. She's in the same room as I am when I am doing work. And, you know, I pause when she needs me and just, I, you have to be very able and willing if you're going to do it the way that I'm doing it so far, um, to be able to, uh, stop your train of thought on one area and completely change it into the other area, meaning you stop being a, a show host for a second and you start being a mom for a second. You stop breastfeeding for a second and you jump into a publicity strategy session. And go, going back and forth like that, I I feel very calm about going back to work because as any new mom, I was very anxious about going back to work because I didn't want to I didn't want to leave my baby. I didn't want someone else to be the primary caregiver, but I also am very passionate about what I want to do. So it's a very, um, you feel this very, this very, almost this torment. You feel torn about what you want to do. And doing this integrated work parenting schedule so far has just, I mean, it's worked out fabulously and it's been a big blessing in my life. Yeah. No, that's part of the reason that I wanted to transition away from opera, you know, professionally and traveling and all of that and into working from home, making YouTube videos, so that I would be able to do exactly what you're saying, this kind of 
uh, what, what do they call this, this synergy or something? Like, yeah. <laughs> you've yeah. got the baby here, you've got your, your computer here, you're working back and forth and, and yeah. just so that I could be more involved because I knew as soon as I had kids, if I wanted to be an opera singer, I would either have to take them away from their dad to be with me for six weeks while I'm traveling or I would be away from my baby for six weeks and someone else is going to be taking care of my baby. Yeah. And that was never something I, I wanted. I wanted to be around. Um, if you have that luxury, I mean, how lucky are we that we can? But it's uh, it's something that I feel is, I look forward to. And I'm, I say, it sounds great how you're doing it. If you can handle it, it gives me hope for, for when I'm doing it. <laughs> well, check back with me in a couple months. We'll see how I'm doing that. <laughs> <laughs> True enough. I know it's always a it's a tricky thing to handle. Um, even now, work life balance without a baby is hard. So I totally get it. Um, so being a conservative influencer, I get a ton of hate. People see it in the comments all the time. Um, but you are also in that exact same arena. So people often ask, how do we handle that kind of hate? So how do you handle it? How do you handle the hate comments? Well, I handle it in a couple of ways. First of all, I'm kind of thick-skinned to begin with, so I guess sticks and stones, you know? It doesn't it doesn't bother me too much. If it does get to be too much, I just, you know, close Twitter, close Instagram. I just turn it off and get back to my my real life, my regular life. Um so you have to have that self-control to get away from it if you are the subject of a pylon and you do feel that it's starting to bother you. Um, I, I think it's also just a mental game. So if someone, for example, you know, calls me a name, hurls an insult, you know, an ad hominem, I ask myself, well, is that true? Are you a bimbo? And I'll be like, no, I'm not. Then it shouldn't bother you if someone says it. Who cares? It's mean. And you can acknowledge that it's mean. It never feels good when someone says something mean. But if it's if if we're talking about a deeper level than that, you know, if it's talking about your self image, what you think of yourself or how you operate, if it's not true, then it really shouldn't bother you that much. Uh, it shouldn't affect your behavior. The other thing that's really important is the ability to step away from that. And you have to have something to step away to. So I, I'm really lucky. And this is both um, because I was blessed with an incredibly strong family, an incredibly close family. But it's also by design that I have the ability to step away into what I call my regular life. You know, being a wife, being a mom, being a sister, being a daughter, being a friend. Most of my closest friends have been friends uh, I've been friends with since long before I was in the public eye. And so I'm just regular old Liz to them, right? It's not it's not the political arena. It's not the cultural battlefield um, when I step away to that. And having them as a support system when, you know, is invaluable because they agree with my principles. They agree with how valuable the fight that I'm fighting is. Um, and it's it, that support system. I don't I don't think I could probably be as effective in the cultural arena as I am if it weren't for the fact that I have this strong support system to counteract the hate that I also receive from um, from people who disagree with what I say. Yeah. And I think it's going off of what you said. I think it is really important to know who you are before entering the arena, because once you know who yes. you are, then when pe exactly as you mentioned, as soon as someone says something about you, you can say that's just not true. And that has been right, a right. huge thing for me. A huge technique for me is if somebody says something about me, I honestly look at it and I'm like, you know what? It's just not true. So if it's not true, it doesn't bother me. Right. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, and that's that's why I'm not a huge advocate of uh, – of, how do I even say this, of pushing kids, wonder kids into, you know, conservative wonder kids sometimes pop up. I really don't think that that's the place for it. That's the time to educate them so that when they're old enough to be able to handle the hatred, um, the criticism, they know who they are. Um, that's what I would encourage anybody. Like, really know what your foundational principles are. Be comfortable with who God made you. Acknowledge what your flaws are because we're all flawed. Uh, acknowledge what your strengths are and what your gifts are so that you know how who you are and that this and that the hatred or the criticism or the mean comments or the angry trolls don't take up residence in your mind about yourself, that you can just let them roll off your back. Or if it becomes too much, you can just put your phone face down on the counter and turn off Twitter notifications for a little while. Um, and go back to whatever your regular life is, go back to researching the stuff that you do for work. That's what I do. Or go back to being a mom, being a wife. And, you know, I, I'm confident in who I am. I'm confident in my principles. And so it, it doesn't bother me. It doesn't bother me to a great extent at this point. Yeah, I think that's great. And I hope that 
more people can take strength from it because I think seeing more people, st I think what you often see on the internet is uh, influencers crying about how they've been attacked by trolls. And I understand it. I'm not gonna, you know, get down on them because I can imagine it's, it's difficult. But at the same time, I also think it's good for young people to see the other side. The people who are saying, you know what? People can say mean things to you and it's okay. Like that's their problem. Yeah. Because I think we've gotten a little bit into a habit. I remember of, as kids, there's the thing of, you know, stick and, sticks and stones will break my, bro my bones, but words will never hurt me. And I think that that's been like really flipped. <laughs> in, yeah, uh, now in... they tell us that words are actual violence. Exactly, exactly. And it's like, you know what? No, words will never hurt me. They're words. If you say something that is mean or demeaning, Yes, if you hear it all the time too much and you're you're paying too much attention to it and you aren't stepping away and going to your support systems and turning off your phone, yeah, that's going to it's going to hurt. But if you are being smart about it and you know who you are and you can recognize where those comments are coming from, it it doesn't have to be so bad. Right. And you can also recognize your own line. Some people have different tolerance levels. If you know that you're susceptible to those comments taking residence in your head, that you can't stop thinking about them, you're worried that they might be true, then don't read your mentions at all, right? If you know that you're pretty thick-skinned and it really doesn't bother you, you know what you know about yourself and you're fine with people saying mean things because you know they're doing it because they can't answer your facts, then go ahead and spend a lot of time in your mentions. But you, And that's different for each individual, that tolerance level of it. And you have to be very self-aware to to, to recognize what that tolerance level is and then have the self-control to guard so that you don't, you don't, you know, intake more than you can tolerate. Yeah. I mean, I was, I was bullied a lot as a kid. So I think maybe that's where I got my thick skin because <laughs> nowadays I'm like, oh, you're whatever. I, I've dealt with this when I was like four. It's fine. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, everybody, I agree with you. Everybody has a different tolerance for it. So just figuring out what your tolerance is, is what's going to make your life better in the long run. Yeah, we were both raised in big families, so we both also got used to that. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Well, on that note, <laughs> thank you so much for coming on my channel today. I loved having you. I hope to have you again. I love talking to you. Me too. Thank you so much for having me. This was great. It's it's hard to believe that all this time went by so quickly. <laughs> it's so true. Thank you so much for watching today's video. Make sure to follow Liz Wheeler everywhere that she's on social media and to follow her podcast. I would love if you would subscribe to my channel if you're not subscribed already and make sure to hit that notification bell. I'd also love if you would consider subscribing to my Substack newsletter where you'll get access to exclusive content such as weekly articles and two exclusive videos every single month. If you'd like to follow me on social media. It's at Classically Abby absolutely everywhere. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you guys in my next video. Bye!